Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I really thank you all for attending. It is my pleasure to introduce you to John Incrod. John is a flight respiratory therapist with Avent Health Flight One and an active member of their Flight One Professional Practice Council. John is an instructor and a field training officer for the EMS department in critical care. John also flies with Jet ICU, providing his expertise in medical evacuation and repatriation around the world. He holds many certifications and memberships to support his clinical knowledge, like of course, basic life support, advanced cardiac life support as a provider and an instructor. He also has neonatal respiration as well as pediatric advanced life support. With many lectures under his belt nationally, Please help me welcome John Ingrad. Welcome, everybody. Winnie, thank you for the introduction. Thank you uh, to you and to Ed Coombs and to Drager uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I think this is really good material. I hope I present it very well. I don't like to say that this is a lecture because all of you out there are my colleagues. So I like to call this a discussion. And as I said to Winnie, I really like interaction. So if you guys have a question during this and you want to ask it, we can certainly hold up for a minute or two, answer a question. Because sometimes you get a question in your head and we wait till the end and maybe it goes away and you forget what you wanted to ask. So uh, this is my best play on Hamlet, tube or not tube, like to be or not to be, which from the play essentially means to live or not to live. But I'm going to kind of hopefully debunk some of those, you know, thoughts about not living or not doing well unless we intubate you. Because, you know, obviously in the current atmosphere, we're all saturated with COVID. We all get it now. Um, I'm not going to make this in the context of COVID. There's going to be a lot of things in this lecture that don't relate to that because we still have our patients that have COPD exacerbations and cardiogenic pulmonary edema and respiratory failure secondary to sepsis. So we know about COVID, we get it. We're gonna hopefully focus on kind of the big picture. And this is about bedside decisions and critical care transport. Um, there is transport stuff in here clearly because that's my bread and butter, but also from a bedside perspective in the ICU and how you make those, those decisions there. So again, thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you taking some time to join us. Uh, my disclosure, I've got really, uh, nobody supporting me for this lecture. This is something I enjoy doing. Uh, no commercial sponsorship and images or uh, you know, verbiage of certain products does not mean an endorsement, but certainly to illustrate a point. I will also disclose that we are under severe weather here in Orlando and even where Winnie is in Tampa. So thunderclaps and lightning strikes are unscheduled, just so you guys know. So objectives today, we will identify evidence-based approaches to initiating non-invasive ventilation in the pre-hospital and emergency setting. And the reason why I include that is because I think as respiratory therapists, sometimes unless you have a medic background or if you've done ride-alongs with pre-hospital folks, you will appreciate what you have in the hospital compared to what they have in the field. Here in Orange County, they don't even have RSI. Um, they're very limited in their scope when it comes to CPAP and what kind of pressures they can use and the equipment that they have. So when I start talking about some of these things with non-invasive approaches, it get, you get a real appreciation for what they deal with in the field. And remember, what we do in the emergency room tends to follow the patient to the ICU. So this is all about patient advocacy too, so we will cover some of that. Discuss the psychological aspect of airway control. Just because you have a hammer, not everything is a nail. So you don't have to go around intubating everybody that might have a little bit of respiratory distress. There's also a psychological aspect to that. You can be really good at getting airways, and you may find somebody who's 350 pounds with no neck that could be the easiest intubation in the world, and the skinny guy from the nursing home may be one of the most difficult airways you've seen. So there is a psychological aspect to that, and we will discuss that briefly. Explain and describe benefits and risks of invasive and non-invasive ventilation in acute hypoxemic patients and recognize predictors of failure. I'm here to hopefully tell you and share with you guys that um, not everybody needs an arterial blood gas. I think sometimes that becomes punitive and we don't need an arterial blood gas to say, my God, my patient is failing non-invasive ventilation or heated high flow, maybe we need to intubate. That being said, uh, we will discuss some of those predictors of failure. And review a case history of hypoxic and hypercarbic respiratory failure in the, in the decision process. I'm gonna end this lecture with a very, uh, Detailed but sad story, uh, just to kind of give you a preface of what's to come. 
but certainly some decisions that were made at the bedside that um, really kind of kept a lot of bad things at bay. So we'll get there. Really quickly about me, I was born and raised in Sarasota, about an hour south of where Winnie is. Uh, I've spent 29 years in this fantastic profession. I can't say enough good things about what we do as respiratory therapists. I'm so proud to go out and to teach high schoolers about what we do and to go into other uh, schools and colleges to talk about what we do and certainly what we do in the field clinically. So I hope that you guys also share that same passion. I am the current AARC section chair for surface and air transport. That's recent. And I'm looking forward to some, so some great work and collaboration with my transport teammates as well as my other uh, specialty section teammates in the uh, coming couple of years. I was proud to be named the 2016 Surface and Air Transport Specialty Practitioner of the Year. It's very humbling. Uh, so I thank everybody for that. And I currently serve as the Associate Director for the Florida Society for Respiratory Care, it's Region 4 area, which is Central Florida. I'm in my sixth year of an adjunct faculty position with the University of Florida's Critical Care Paramedicine Program. So that is certainly um, when you talk to paramedics and you start teaching them what we do, you guys would you guys would be proud to know that they have great respect for what we do, and they also have great respect for what we do with the mechanical ventilator. My program, Advent Health Flight One, we're a dual EC-145 program. We're based here at our new, brand new hangar at Orlando Executive Airport, just to the east of downtown Orlando. Um, Archangel One and Archangel Two are our call signs. We started in 1985, so we're approaching 37 years. And since the inception of this program, we have always flown in RN, our RT configuration. We do that with NICU teams, pediatric teams, and the adult team, of which I am part of. We do interfacility transport only. Our bread and butter is cardiogenic shock, uh, respiratory failure from sepsis, uh, medically complex patients, and the neurovascular emergencies that we see. And we do about 800 flights annually, and our vendor is Metro Aviation. So I'm going to start with a couple of brief case studies, and a segment I call, So What Would You Do? Um, and this is kind of interactive. You guys are welcome to ask questions when you can um, kind of moderate that if there's some questions that come through. But just kind of what would you do in these situations? 65-year-old male patient presents to the ED by private vehicle with the following symptoms. This guy looks like he got out of a swimming pool. His respiratory rates are in the upper 30s. His BP is 220 over 110. His heart rate's tacky at 130. Sats are 77, and he sounds like he's gurgling up to his shoulders. Okay? You guys know this, you guys have seen this. So you would establish IV access, apply nitro paste, give ADA Lasix and prepare for RSI. Or you establish IV access, give 25 ketamine, sublingual nitro, prepare CPAP 12 to 15, and you become that patient's human gag factor to make sure that they tolerate that. So what would you do? Not only what would you do, what do you see in current practice? What do you think would happen at your facility? in this situation. Be a one answer CPAP. Okay. Letter B is another selection. Establish IV, IV access. Yeah, more Bs. Uh, CPAP, but why ketamine? BiPAP, lots of Bs. Okay. Yep. All right, excellent guys. Um, so remember, you have to understand that this is a patient. You guys are correct. B is right. I hope that that's what we see in clinical practice. Let's let's go back to A real quick. You, IV access, you give nitro, you, you treat them with Lasix, which they probably don't need. They probably need positive pressure ventilation, but they're going to get Lasix anyway. And prepare for RSI. If you lay this guy flat and you RSI this cat, you're in trouble, right? You could be in severe trouble. There's a lot of issues with, obviously, with hypoxia in this patient and the pre-intubation possibility of this guy getting massively hypotensive and coding on you. So the, the ketamine, obviously, for its bronchodilatory effect, and also because it's going to hopefully calm your patient, dissociate them a little bit. Um, I'm all for, for ketamine as opposed to some of the benzos that are out there. CPAP 12 to 15, guys in the field, a lot of times their max CPAP is 10 or even seven and a half. And they use those easy flow masks with the spring valve that they load. So it's not conducive for some of these really, really sick patients. 
So it is correct that you would do B. Um, it, we're going to get to another case study here in just a second that maybe we did a little bit too much, but excellent, excellent work, you guys. It would be B. So here's a 71 year old female comes into the ER, chest pain, shortness of breath, significant history for coronary artery disease, hypertension, AFib, COPD. You can see that there with the, the lungs. She was found on a non rebreather at 12 liters per minute, respiratory rates in the 40s, SAT 88. Excuse me, she cannot complete her talk in complete sentences. Troponin's 0.36. She's hypertensive as well, and you can see the chest x ray there, right? So they started her on BiPAP, 12 over 5. You see the settings there, the repeat blood gas. Air transport was done from the satellite facility to our place for PCI. She had a right circumflex and right coronary that were re stenosed, secondary to uh, some previous stents that were placed. 12 hours after the interventions, you can see another ABG. Again, we're sticking this lady all the time. Repeat chest x ray is as follows. You can see that things have gotten better and improved. So clearly you're not going to throw some plastic down this patient's throat. But the point to this is, is that you know, the gentleman before certainly needed some CPAP. BiPAP, eh, you maybe overcome a little bit of work of breathing, but you can see here on this lady, we BiPAPed her and she was kind of over BiPAP, right? I mean, she's, seven, she's alkalotic, she's a COPD patient. You can clearly see that she's compensated. She probably lives in that 50, 60 CO2 club. So, BiPAP in this case may have been a little bit too much, right? So as respiratory therapists, certainly in the emergency room setting, we should be advocates because remember, is everything, uh, does everybody get BiPAP? It, that just seems to be the nomenclature, right? Somebody comes in and doc says, I'll throw them on BiPAP. The doctor don't need BiPAP, they may just need CPAP. So transport of a COVID-19 positive patient on heated high flow nasal cannula. Uh, my partner Jason and I just had a piece published in the December Air Medical Journal about this specific patient. And the reason why we published this is because we call it oxygen economics. And because when you put somebody on heated high flow and you try to get them from an ICU to a helicopter, from a helicopter into a facility that's 40 minutes away, you got to be really, really cognizant of your oxygen supply because you can run out very quickly. 43-year-old male, it's COVID positive, going from a satellite facility back to our place for BV ECMO placement. This wasn't a consult. This guy was going straight to the OR to get cannulated. He was on 60 liters per minute, 100% FiO2. His SATs were 86 to 90. If this guy moved in bed, he became very tachypnic and he dropped his SATs into the low 80s. You all know the patient. You guys have all seen this. So they're flipping between BiPAP and heated high flow. He's on heated high flow for us. There's a BiPAP at the bedside that sometimes he'll go back and forth between. So basically, we threw this guy on a tank, took him right out to the helicopter. By the time I went from his bedside to the helo on a D tank, I was down to about five, 600 PSI off the book of the tank. It was a rather lengthy walk to the helipad. And I thought, wow, this is, this is something that, you know, a lot of air programs weren't doing heated high flow at the time. And some of them are now getting into the heated high flow business. Now I'm talking about adults. For pediatrics and for, for neonates, we've had high flow for a while. But you know, obviously COVID presented this, this treatment paradigm for us. So we did this piece on uh, oxygen economics and we looked at all the standard tanks that we use in transport, M tank, E tank, H tank, and D tank. We did the calculations, we did some bench studies with our Hamilton T1 and we came up with these charts and they are pretty spot on. We give you a 200 PSI cushion. So all these times here, uh, all these flow or all these uh, charts here, with the flows and associated FiO2s are pretty spot on. So you can see our design there and the uh, EC145, kind of how we hook up the high flow. Um, and we were very privileged as uh, Advent Health Flight 1 to be featured on the AMJ cover from December. So that was pretty cool. But again, this guy went straight to the OR, got cannulated, but you have to be very, um, again, cognizant of going from bedside to helicopter and having the right amount of oxygen. Well, once you get in the aircraft, if you're you know, going 30 minutes to a facility, 40 minutes to a facility, you're probably going to be fine. We, in our new aircraft, we have a lock system, so certainly we have a lot more than we do with our gas system in the old 145. Uh, but again, knowing uh, how much oxygen you have and, and how far you have to go, having these charts available too help a lot. So, so I like this slide because when I did my, I did a, a webcast over the summer with a group up in the Midwest and we talked about this exact topic. 
And the one guy said, you know, I think of CPAP is when a dog sticks his head out the window and gives himself that extra. And I was like, is that CPAP or would that be high flow? So anyway, I thought that was kind of cute because uh, remembering guys that, you know, it's kind of like Coke, Pepsi, leave a fed, Epi, you know, is it, is it the same thing when we talk about CPAP and BiPAP? I mean, no, it's not. So I think it has to be given to the appropriate patient, uh, started at the appropriate time. We really can't get behind the eight ball on some of these guys because then this is kind of where you end up and the whole intubation process. And again, I talk about psychology and placement of the airway. Uh, there's a guy out of Canada called, named Dr. George Kovacs and he talks about the rule of 90s. Systolic pressure at least 90, a saturation of at least 90, and no more than 90 seconds to get that airway. And 90 seconds, that doesn't mean you sit there with a laryngoscope for 90 seconds searching and poking for an airway. That means this airway is secured, done, second attempt or whatever within 90 seconds, okay? So when we talk about airway psychology, and the difficulty of some of that is you, know, you don't just walk in there with a laryngoscope. There are a lot of auditory stimuli. There's a lot of tactile stimulus, right? You put the laryngoscope in, it's a little bit tougher and a little bit more hard to get that tongue out of the way than maybe what you thought it would be. Hey, this guy's really skinny. I thought his malum potty would be like one or two. You get that laryngoscope in there, you can't see what you thought you'd see. The saturations are slowly toning down, toning down. And there's always some jack saying, hey, your sats are 70. Well, your sats are 65, right? So we always have that person that's always reminding us of how our sats are going. So that being said, that presents another realm of difficulty, right? Because you've, you've intubated countless patients and they were all relatively easy. Maybe you've had to do a second attempt on, on a few, but now you have been faced with this, wow, this is a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. And things start to, to play into that. So again, I said at the beginning, just because you have your a hammer, not everything is a nail. And again, if you haven't looked at the Dunning-Kruger curve, this is a real thing. Um, basically your confidence outweighs your wisdom. In other words, you get out of school, you're feeling great, you've got that degree, you've done your rotations, you've intubated a grand total of maybe three people in the OR who haven't been fed for 12 hours, who are anesthetized and paralyzed, so that's the easiest intubation you can do, and you think, I've got the world by the you-know-what. So my confidence is really high. I've been out of school for about uh, maybe a year. Um, you get to a place before you get knocked down by maybe said patient that we just talked about. It's a lot more difficult to intubate. You couldn't get it on the first or second try. Somebody else comes in, gets the tube right away. You kind of get that, that confidence knocked down a little bit. So then you end up at what they call the peak of Mount Stupid. And that is when you have, you enter that program termination zone where you really sit back and second guess, am I right for this? Did I choose the right field? Should I have done more ride-alongs? Did I vet this process you know, to the best of my ability? So you kind of sink down to the valley of despair. You get your experience under your belt. You spend a lot of time in rounds. You do the proper things. You get your certificates and your training and your, your degrees and all that. And then you hopefully end up in the plateau of sustainability and the guru status. But again, you guys have all seen that. Listen, I came out of school with some great confidence too. I went through this exact same curve uh, when I worked over in Bradenton, Florida. So it's certainly, um, it kind of directed my career in the right path. And I, I believe and I hope that I'm at some place now where I can continue to succeed. So again, be careful what you wish for because you may not see that picture in the middle. You may see these two pictures off to the right and left and you can't see any airway at all and uh, things become a little bit more difficult. So we have many faces of non-invasive ventilation. In fact, I'm not, I'm not including COVID here, we get it. This is some of the other stuff before COVID was around. And we've talked about flu and we've talked about respiratory failure, secondary to cardiogenic pulmonary edema. All of the things that we put patients on BiPAP and CPAP for, and now he did high flow for, right? Pre-oxygenation before intubation. I'm a huge proponent of that. If you have a patient that's on CPAP or BiPAP before you put a tube in them, uh, I would suggest leaving them on that until you are ready to do your first look approach. And when you do that, I'm a huge fan as I hope everybody is, of apneic oxygenation, put in a 10 liter cannula on their nose while you perform your procedure, and really that procedure should not take any more than 90 seconds. Again, that's not looking for 90 seconds, that means the entire thing from start to finish. So again, you guys kind of see everybody here that we put on those, I'm not gonna belabor this slide, 
and go over each one of these, but you guys have all seen patients and put patients on non-invasive for all of these exact issues. So again, what's the difference? You know, is, is it Coke and Pepsi? Is it Levo and, and Epi? It, it's, it's really not. And I know that you all can appreciate that. You know, when you have a patient that comes into the emergency room or even in the ICU, let's go to the ICU, uh, and you have somebody who's hypoxic and maybe they are ventilating okay, do we need to put this patient on BiPAP? Do we need to put them on, you know, overventilate them just so we can get that effect of oxygenation? Well, no. So you guys can, can use CPAP in the ICU. Maybe we don't need to put everybody on BiPAP. And then the heated high flow folks, right? Maybe this person can't tolerate a pressurized mask slapped on their face with 15 of pressure. And that's why I think ketamine is probably a good choice for that patient who's having that tachypnic issue, who's having that respiratory crisis, because maybe that calms them down or dissociates them just enough to be able to tolerate that mask on their face. So clearly you guys are all familiar with heated high flow. It can maybe provide a little bit of positive pressure, maybe up to six, based on how your patient's breathing. Now, if your patient's breathing with their mouth open or if your patient's very, very tachypnic, you might not get that, that sort of pressure. But again, we don't need to basically exclude everything else and somebody comes in and says, well, let's just put them on BiPAP, BiPAP, BiPAP. Let's advocate for your patient. Let's look at the big picture, 30,000 foot view, and maybe this patient doesn't need two pressures. So defining respiratory failure, a syndrome where the respiratory system fails in one or both of its gas exchange functions. That's oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide elimination. So failure may be acute, chronic, or acute on chronic. The most common form, so acute on chronic, obviously we see your PD exacerbation. Most common form of respiratory failure can be associated with virtually all acute diseases of the lung. So examples, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, ARDS, and PE, because the most common type of respiratory failure is type one or hypoxic respiratory failure. I'm gonna stop there just for a second. Does anybody have any questions? Is there any questions in the box that we can answer or discuss? I don't have any questions as of yet. Okay, excellent, perfect. So we talk about type one hypoxic respiratory failure. We've seen a lot of that over the past two years low oxygen, normal or low carbon dioxide levels. So pulmonary edema, pneumonia, ARDS, we'll throw COVID-19 in there. And it's not COVID-19, it's the pneumonia associated with COVID-19 and some of the fibrotic airway issues that we have with these patients. Chronic pulmonary fibrosis, alveolitis or IPF. Again, the most common type of respiratory failure associated with most forms of acute lung disease. Hypercapnic with associated hypoxia. Low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, not uncommon that we see these two. Uh, COPD, chest wall deformities, respiratory muscle weakness, such as Guillain-Barre, myasthenia, central nervous system depression of the uh, respiratory center, drug overdose, brainstem lesions, uh, some sort of neuro issues. And of course, central and obstructive apnea can also cause respiratory failure. So they came out with this score. This is a group out of MedStar Washington up in DC. They came out with the HACOR score for predicting heated high flow nasal cannula, cannula failure. And I'm all for checklists. I'm all for scoring scales. We use the LIP score. We use the SAFE score. We use the you know, PF ratio. And that's not really not a score, but more of a diagnostic sort of number or surrogate. So they came out with heart rate, acidosis, consciousness, oxygenation, and respiratory rate. And again, we have the scoring mechanism. They're talking about acidosis. Now, can you guys get a venous gas and, and trust that? I'm curious. If you got a venous blood gas and you're just looking for acid-based abnormalities, will that work? Yes or no? I've got a yes, yes, and a no. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer, is, the answer is yes. If you're looking for straight acid-based abnormalities, you can do a venous blood gas and you will be very, very close to what an arterial blood gas is going to show you. Your oxygenation is going to be obviously off. That's what we have pulse oximetry for. Uh, but at the same time, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an advocate for continuously sticking patients, especially the DKA patient that comes in and you may be, you know, again, this may be more of a punitive that only will exacerbate their issue and that will make them not want to come to the ER sooner for something that could be life-threatening. So if we're looking for straight acid-based abnormalities, uh, I'm going to drop a name here, Keith Lamb. 
Keith, when he was in Iowa, did some really good uh, stuff on this. And venous blood gas will keep or uh, will show your acid base abnormalities, uh, just like an ABG will. But nonetheless, this group uh, came out with this score. Uh, they had 150 patients that were enrolled. Almost 70% had a benefit, while over a third failed the intervention. Heart rate, respiratory rate, PF ratio improved within the first hour in the success group. That's not always the case. So you're going to see another study here shortly that the improving PF ratio did not matter. The failure group had a higher HACOR score and at its initiation and with subsequent checks. So at one hour, 12 hours, 24, and 48 hours. And scores greater than five, max score of 25 after an hour, had an 80% failure rate. 80% failure rate with a score of five. You want to see how fast we can get to five? Look at this. So heart rate, pH. I mean, if your pH is 7.3 to 7.34, you've got two points. If you're a little bit confused with 11 or 12 GCS, you've got two or five points. You're already at greater than five. So this is a very, very tight scale. Um, again, you can use this scale. Uh, really, it's pretty effective. And also look at your patient, right? A lot of times when I tell people that all the time, I, I can look at a patient. I can see that they're tachypnic. Their SATs are still in the 80s. They're on max FiO2. They're on 18 over 12. Or they're on 60 liters and 100%. And I, this is something else that we should advocate for, because I'm sure that you guys have all seen this too. 60 liter high flow, 100% off bio two with a non-rebreather over the fix. What are we trying to accomplish with that? We are, we are putting off the inevitable, we are letting our patients suffer, and it's doing nothing. So it's always baffled me, you know, from the transport realm, I don't deal with that, but when I go work PRN shifts in an ICU, and I see these patients, well, throw a non-rebreather on them, what, for what? Are you, giving, are you giving them 150% oxygen now? So let's try and advocate for that, that happening. If we need to go to BiPAP from heated high flow, maybe we could do that, or maybe this patient just needs to buy a tube. So anyway, just showing you guys here what the HACOR score looks like and exactly how quick you can get to a level of five. And again, add all these numbers up, these max numbers of one, four, 10, six, four, that's the max scale of 25. Uh, this is this lecture I'm giving now. It was kind of a recycled lecture that I gave about six years ago. But nonetheless, uh, I included this in here because a lot of these slides are different. I changed them up to our current environment. I left this one in because this is a group out of Mesa, Arizona. And when you think about EMS folks and putting patients on non-invasive ventilation, I will tell you right now, in Central Florida, no EMS agency in this area has the capability to do IPAP. When I say EMS, I'm talking about Lake County, Osceola County, Orange County, Volusia County, all the way over to the West Coast. Now, you may have critical care transport trucks that have Rebels or maybe a T1 or they, you know, they have these capabilities. But think about if you're out in Mesa, Arizona, or you're out in New Mexico, or you're in Utah, and let's pretend you are three hours from your location by ground. So they came out, they basically invested the money. They had a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation approach. They, they got a whole, whole protocol for it. You know, if, if you're in Orlando, if you're in Atlanta or wherever you are and you're six minute ride within the hospital, it is not financially capable for these EMS agencies to put $10,000, $12,000, $15,000 ventilators or non-invasive devices on all of their trucks. It just won't happen. So they came out with, you know, these guys came out with their own uh, algorithm and their own protocol because certainly they are a lot further away from um, from hospitals than most of our, you know, urban areas are. So hurdles when instituting non-invasive ventilation in the pre-hospital setting, outcomes of patients placed on NIV in the pre-hospital setting. We're not real sure uh, of what those are. You know, do they come into the hospital because they were put on CPAP earlier or even BiPAP in the field? Did they do better in the hospital? Cost association, you guys get that. You, kind of what I just said, you can't put these thousand, thousand, dollar devices on each truck because it's just not it's not feasible. Did it reduce intubations and mortality with NIV application in the pre-hospital setting? That's something else that we could look at. And properly trained personnel on NIV applications, which is so, so important. Um, you know, not only being able to put the patient on it, but being able to stay with the patient. There's something we call set it and forget it. And I cannot stand it when I see whether it's a colleague or somebody else go into the emergency room, throw the patient on BiPAP and split or go do something. 
I get it, we're all busy. We all have other patients in the ER that we have to tend to, and even in the ICU. The past two years has been held, so I know that we've gotten uh, a lot of things there. But when you go into an ER and you set by somebody on 12 over five, you know, the cookie cutter settings, 12 over five or 16 over eight or whatever it could be, and then you walk away. And then that patient doesn't do as well because maybe they're too anxious or maybe they need somebody just to sit there for 15 or 20 minutes and hold their hand and say, look, we got you. Everything's going to be okay. Give me some time and things will be fine. So properly trained, yes, but also maybe a little empathy, right? Trying to understand what that patient is going through. I did a lecture called the RT is your best friend on your worst day. And think about it. Airway, breathing, circulation. Well, we're two thirds of that equation. So take a little time, hold your patient's hand, tell them everything's gonna be okay, make sure that they're as comfortable as they can be. And if they're not, maybe have a discussion with the nurse and the physician about just maybe a, a skosh, a little bit of whether it's ketamine or whether it's uh, Ativan, just to kind of calm the nerves a little bit. Uh, Mesa fires, um, non-invasive respiratory failure and distress algorithm. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and just knock this slide out because there's a lot going on here. but this may have been refined again that gems article was from 2014 it's rather old so this could be refined by now but certainly something that they did for the for the positive contraindications for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation we're all very familiar with that um, secretions alter, alter mental status facial deformities such as trauma hemodynamic instability that's a big one we're going to get to those slides here in just a second but you know we really maybe we don't think as much about that hemodynamic uh, insult that we could be causing with some of these non-invasive devices. But we get it with invasive mechanical ventilation, you're increasing the intrathoracic pressure, you're decreasing venous return, you could have a very bad effect on that. But kind of let's back out of that a little bit. You know, we put these patients on, so we're gonna talk about a septic study here shortly. And patients with mean air or for, with um, uh, MAPs that were less than 65 for systolic blood pressures that were less than 90, they're having issues and they did not do so well on this non-invasive stuff. So uh, we'll talk about that in a second. High aspiration risk, recent upper uh, GI surgery, life-threatening hypoxemia and untrained staff. We saw a lot of that, right? We saw a lot of life-threatening hypoxemia. We threw them on 150% oxygen, remember? But it's important to recognize that and to put these patients on the proper device and to know what you're doing with that. This is an old Swiss study, but I wanted to leave it in here because I kind of emphasizes the impact of a dedicated non-invasive ventilation team on intubation and mortality rates and severe COPD exacerbations. This is our bread and butter, you guys. This is who we see all the time. And what they looked at is basically whether a dedicated team of RTs applying all acute NIV treatment would reduce the risk of intubation or death for subjects with COPD admitted for respiratory failure. And again, this is very old. You can see the, the uh, First cohort was back in 2001, 2003, and then 2010, 2012. Total of 126 subjects were included, 53 in the first, 73 in the second. 15 subjects died, had to go uh, tracheal intubation for the first cohort, and only 10 subjects in the second. So basically, the delivery of NIV by a dedicated team, well, that would be us, we're respiratory therapists, so we're pretty dedicated, was associated with a lower risk of death and intubation in subjects with respiratory failure, second and COPD exacerbation. We know what we're doing. I think we all know what we're doing when we put these patients on these non-invasive devices and exactly what we're trying to do with them. So that will keep patients from getting intubated. That's what this whole lecture is about. Decisions, bedside decisions on how we're going to keep our patients off mechanical ventilation and when to pull that trigger, okay? This is an Indian study from 2016. Again, I wanted to leave it in here. It talks about predictors of non-invasive ventilation failure in the ICU. Uh, for ARDS patients. It was prospective observational study over a three-year period using the Berlin definition. 170 patients were initially managed with NIV. Failure was seen up to 44% of the 96 and 29 of those patients, nearly 70% died. Low baseline PF ratio, shock, and ARD severity were associated with NIV failure and increased mortality. Non-invasive ventilation failure and mortality were significantly higher in moderate and severe ARDS. And that is an area there where I think we, and Tom Piranha does a really great piece on non-invasive. He's very, very good to listen to when we speak about non-invasive. And, you know, that, that moderate to severe ARDS patient that maybe we can leave on BiPAP or we think we can leave on BiPAP, but yet they continue to get worse. 
Like when do you pull the trigger? Why do we leave patients on bypass for three days, hoping that that PO2 gets better, hoping that their acidosis gets better? I don't, I, I, I don't get that picture. I think again, that goes back to the advocacy of respiratory therapists saying, Doc, this guy's not getting better. We don't need to wait 72 hours. I think if you don't see an improvement within four hours, you probably should be discussing other adjuncts. Non-invasive ventilation may be useful in selected patients with mild ARDS, but should be used with great caution in moderate and severe. So kind of that breakdown, you can see here, um, you guys can kind of follow me. Moderate and severe, so look at the severe. There's initial NIV, severe six. They failed five. Four of the six died. Look at the moderate group, 37 included, 18 died. So nearly 50% of the moderate group, almost 70% of the severe group. So that moderate to severe population, uh, somebody that we need to really watch out for. And wow, should we be putting these patients on non-invasive devices or should we pull the trigger and put the tube in, right? I know that early on in COVID that our trigger and our threshold to tube is very, very little. And again, what happened in China and Italy kind of translated to the, to the United States. China had a threshold as high as six, as low as six liters per minute nasal cannula. I shouldn't say as high as, as low as six liter per minute nasal cannula before they were intubating patients. So you kind of saw that with us in the US. I mean, in some of the more recent strains, we're trying to withhold, not withhold, we're trying to hold off on intubation and treat them with non-invasive devices, hoping that we don't have to, right? Because we know what happens when they get intubated a lot of bad things can happen. So, the, but the question is, when do we pull that trigger, right? And I think this is a pretty good indication of that moderate to severe group. You can see that greater than 50% of these folks did not do so well. This was released in the journal, um, I believe back in 2021, yeah, July of 21. So this is talking about non-invasive ventilation substance with sepsis and acute respiratory failure. When we look at sepsis, guys, what is the biggest cause I'm saying this right, of sepsis. When we look at sepsis, there's three things, right? Lungs, gut, UTIs, or urinary tract. Those three areas are our main sources of sepsis. And the biggest one is pneumonia. Over 50% of patients that get septic are generally septic from pneumonia. So kind of important for us to talk about non-invasive ventilation in patients with sepsis. So retrospective study looked at acute respiratory failure and septic patients, over 50% failure rate for NIV patients with sepsis. And the acuity kind of dictated that, right? Increased SOPA scores, so that's organ failure and other organs, higher FiO2 at non-invasive initiation and hemodynamic compromise. That's that set that systolic less than 90, that MAP less than 65. Those are the patients that are going to fail. So again, we need to be the ones thinking about that and saying, huh, doc, whoever, this might not be a good idea for non-invasive. 136 subject enrolled. Subjects with NIV failure who got tubed were 70%, so you can see they're over 50%. Subjects with successful NIV, no intubation. So it was a pretty close success versus non-success. When reading this article, I can tell you that they did not use max, you know, we tend to like to get the best out of our non-invasive devices before we throw a plastic tube in somebody's throat. So they did not use very high pressures. I think their IPAP got as high as 15, their EPAP as high as eight. So I think that there is some, some other room to move there, but that's a different discussion for a different time. And then oxygenation strategies in critically ill subjects with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID-19. Uh, obviously we'd have to include something like this, so we'll be doing a disservice. Tie-in led prospective study, there was no clear, and there still are no clear international guidelines on how you treat patients with non-invasive devices during a hypoxic episode. Uh, we just kind of, throw them on these pressures, you know, let's aim for a tidal volume five to seven mLs per kg. let's keep their stats greater than 90, they're failing, they get two. 85 subjects, mostly helmet, NIV, and heated hyponasal cannula, 52 subjects or 61% failed and required intubation. This here, this improved PF ratio was not a predictive surrogate of success. So again, we went back to the previous study where PF ratio improvement showed those patients didn't fail. Here's one that says improved PF ratio didn't make a difference. So this, again, looks at different scoring mechanisms. We had the SOFA score in one. This one is the SAPS2 score, greater than 33, a serum lactate. This is lactate dehydrogenase, but we can look at lactates too. When we thought, think about sepsis, lactates greater than four, we're talking lactates that are a lot higher. Again, just showing tissue injury, this is the same scoring that would show tissue injury. Uh, so they had a greater propensity of NIV failure. So 
you guys have, have all experienced this, um, which is kind of showing that when certain patients have these scores and certain patients don't look so good, maybe we, we bypass the NIV. And again, kind of the breakdown of the patients, 104 enrolled intubation as a first line, non-invasive as the first line had 85, 52 failed. So that's a significant amount. That's nearly 60, 65% of your patients that failed. Again, that's a pretty, pretty significant number. All right, so uh, I want to kind of tell you the story. Um, clearly, I live in the town of a mouse. Um, there's a lot of people that are coming back to Central Florida. And this particular patient um, was a 25-year-old female. She's a mother of two young children, six and four. She's visiting Orlando, Walt Disney World. She came into Orlando on December 7th. She is an ICU nurse at an academic tertiary medical care center, has less than five years experience. And social media displays what appears to be a very happy mother and proud professional. Um, when you have a certain case like this and you have certain people that, you know, you, you can look on somebody's social media, but you, you, you get a glimpse into the life of the person that's in front of you who sometimes becomes more than just a patient. So this social media just displayed a very proud mother, a very proud professional, um, and by all senses, just excited to be alive. Uh, no medical history other than two uncomplicated C-sections. She came into one of our satellite facilities on the night of December 11th for abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, generalized weakness. She's awake, alert, she's oriented to person, place, time, and event. Poor diet and poor intake over the past couple of days. Abdomen is described as diffuse but dull and relieved by nothing, or pain in the abdomen, I should say. She claims of rectal pain that she believes to be hemorrhoidal. Denies shortness of breath or chest pain. No history of IBS or IBD or recent illness, and she's been here in Orlando at the parks for the past few days. And again, past history is significant for C-sections. Here's your objective, and you can see some of the values here. Everything in red should catch your attention, uh, especially her white count. Her procalcitonin being greater than 100. Um, if you're familiar with procalcitonin and its inflammatory markers and what it means, that's off the charts. Uh, you can see her liver function test, her BUN creatinine. You guys know what's happening here, right? This is multi-organ failure on somebody who just walked into in, walked into the ER. Uh, her BBG is 716, CO2 is 42. You can see there that's a profound metabolic acidosis. CT admin shows mild wall thickening. You can see kind of there what, what's going on. The rectal pain is a perianal abscess measuring 2.6 by 1.7 by 1.8. This is her x-ray on 12-11 at 7.30, right shortly thereafter, uh, coming into the ER, clear. She has no evidence of acute cardiopulmonary disease and no effusions. So her assessment and plan is to admit no, nothing by mouth, bed rest. Clearly she's in septic shock. She's in acute renal failure. She's got multi-organ dysfunction with the liver enzymes being uh, elevated. So this is possibly necrotizing fasciitis that we're looking at. Colorectal consult was obtained. Surgery consult was obtained. IV access was done in the left IJ. She's had greater than four liters of fluid. Her MAP, uh, she'd been put on leave of fed to keep her MAP greater than 65 and obviously broad spectrum coverage with SOSA. This is her x-ray after her surgery on the 12th. So she's tubed now, obviously worsening uh, diffuse pulmonary infiltrates. She's got a right IJ that's stable. So here's our initial ventilator approach, not ours, but the facility that she's at. Uh, you guys can kind of read the settings there and some of the measured values. So my question to you on the bottom right-hand side of that screen is, are we failing conventional ventilation? Any answers, opinions? I know some very good friends and colleagues of mine who I'm very close with are not fans of dual targeted modes like PRVC. But besides that, I mean, if you look at everything else there, maybe not horrible. Yeah, I but have look. a mixture of no, not necessarily, no, no. One yes, it's not yeah, a know, ventilation. 
Based, no, you're right. Based on what we look there in our acid base, you're correct. Looking at what our ventilator pressures are, right. It, it doesn't appear to be a ventilation problem currently. But when we look at septic patients and we know the whole inflammatory cascade of what can happen with septic shock and what can happen with neck fash, uh, this could become a ventilation problem very quickly. Uh, so treating the patient with very conservative lung protective measures, which appears to be the case here, uh, her ideal body weight was 59 kgs, so certainly she's within the realm of her tidal buoyance, her pressures look okay. Uh, the very, very conservative PEEP FiO2 table there. But you guys are right, it's, it doesn't appear to be a ventilation problem until now. So this is within 24 hours of that previous x-ray. 71% uh, is where her SATs dropped to. They got lower, they got down to, into the 50s, they proned her. Uh, APRV is such a hot topic of discussion. I'm not gonna get into that right now, but the APRV setting seemed very, very suspect to me with a P high of 33 and a P low of 15. I'm, I'm kind of baffled at that. But nonetheless, you can see the blood gas that was obtained. She did have an A-line. Uh, she remained prone after two hours of unsuccessful APRV, which again, I, I, don't, I don't understand the settings in the first place. Back in a volume targeted mode, now her peak inspiratory pressures are 40. So they called us to come get her and take her back to our place for ECMO. So we flew down there in the helo. We get to the bedside and things aren't looking so good. We have SAS that are in the upper 50s to low 60s, patients prone. Um, we, as a crew, uh, Basically, we don't transport patients prone in the helicopter. So we went in with the thought process of, we need to flip this patient, she needs to stabilize. And we asked them to do that before we left. It's a 15 minute flight from our facility. Hey, can you flip the patient, see how the patient does? We're on our way. We get there, the patient's still prone, so that makes us scratch our head. Uh, patient was just coming off CRRT. Um, I suggested to my partner that we talked with the physician, they, let's try some flow land real quick. So we put the patient on flow land. So my question to you is, do you transport prone in the aircraft? What bedside decisions would you make? And do we stay in play with, with a good friend of mine, Jen Watts. Wattsy used to say this in one of her lectures, do we stay in play or do we load and go? So do you make ventilator changes and will it matter now? So do you make ventilator changes and then do you throw somebody in a helicopter or do you stay there, make the changes, see what kind of effect they have? What would you guys do? Go ahead and put your answers in. Stay and play. Stay and play. Yeah. Oh, I got one load and go. Okay. Yeah. Lots of stay and play. Oh yeah, no. Now it's half and half. All right. <laughs> I like I like the thought process. We stayed and yeah, played because we just, we just stabilize we, her. Yeah, we had to stabilize her more. Uh, we can't take somebody out of the ICU with a sat in the sixties. Um, her ventilator settings got more and more aggressive. You can see that's a picture in the screen there. So you guys can see that. Um, so we did stay in play. Uh, flow land was done. We held off my partner because we just said, okay, we're not going to transport in the aircraft. We called our dispatch. Hey, roll a critical care truck to us. We're not transporting her by the aircraft. We're going to take her over there by ground because we're going to leave her prone. And we have protocols in place where we can transport via ground in the prone position with the right amount of people. Um, so we brought a critical care team to kind of complement us as the flight team, um, try to get the patient as stabilized as possible. Uh, had the flow land going, the initial blood gas you can see there, made a few ventilator changes, and after all of that, 40 minutes later, there's your, this is the best you're gonna get, kind of blood gas. So at that point, after nearly an hour at the bedside, we thought, all right, keep her prone, critical care trucks here, let's get her transferred over, buckle her in, and let's get out. Got her to the OR, uneventful transport, transported from OR for immediate cannulation. They put her on the OR ventilator, we flipped her supine, and she coded. And they did get her cannulated, she was there, sent her off to the ICU, massive DIC, um, you guys know what's coming. And then this happened. So, a very unfortunate case. Um, 
it gut punched us really because it was over a weekend and my partner and I came in the next day. It was a, it was a Monday and uh, find out this and she had to be withdrawn. And it just, in our minds, that's all we saw, you know, was this proud nurse, proud mama with her kids at Disney. She had some other family there with her, but it's that kind of patient where you roll home in your car with no music playing and you just think maybe shed a tear. Um, and, and realize what we do can be so special in making a difference. Now, we didn't really get to make a huge difference here, but we did the best we could. And think about it, guys. Had we flipped her at the sending facility, you know what would have happened. So we gave her a chance, and she had a chance. And, you know, around for a day and a half for the family to at least get to Orlando and, and see her and make some decisions was, was key. In conclusion, so assessment, assessment, assessment. Patient presentation, provider impression, timing is everything. We know that. We talk about safely and effectively transporting our patients with the tools that we have, and can we do that? CPAP versus BiPAP versus high flow versus RSI. When do we pull that trigger? What threshold do we have, right? Utilize your scoring tools. Look at your patient assessment. Identifying the right patients for non-invasive approach versus intubation and mechanical ventilation. There are inherent risks to putting somebody down and putting a tube in them. And you guys all know that. You've seen that. Be knowledgeable in your invasive strategies and in your non-invasive equipment. How changes can affect the patient. Will they improve or are they going to do more harm? Close monitoring is crucial in the initial phase of both invasive and non-invasive ventilation. I think when used correctly, NIV has been shown to alleviate symptoms and decrease the need for intubation. And I know, I think you all agree with that, uh, especially with CHF, COPD, and asthma. So is it safe, portable, and easy to apply? CPAP and BiPAP does not replace intubation, but rather a less invasive means of providing respiratory support while medications work to correct the underlying cause. Sometimes it won't matter the decision made. You guys kind of saw that in that case study, but things will happen. Be ready and have plans A, B, C, D, E, and F in place. Be advocates for your patient. There's my contact info real quick. I'll leave that up there for a second. Uh, questions, comments, if you guys want to connect. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, I've gone to three conferences, larger conferences in the past six months. I'm hoping we finally can see each other in New Orleans because, you know, I was really looking forward to 2020 and having you all here in Orlando. Uh, we know how that went. So I'm hoping that New Orleans is going to go off without a hitch. I really like this quote. I don't know exactly who said it. I took this picture out over the Gulf of Mexico in September. So I thought it was gorgeous, but to most people, the sky is the limit. For those who love aviation, the sky is home. And guys, I want to end on this. Um, I don't know if you know this gentleman, his Chief Master Sergeant Dario Rodriguez. Dario is a staple in not only the United States Air Force, but in the respiratory profession. He uh, did a lot of work at the University of Cincinnati, and Dario passed away in the past week. I had the privilege of knowing and working with him. I spoke with him at SNS lectures for the National Stockpile. I spoke with him in Indianapolis on a transport symposium. Uh, just an absolute genuine dude. And it's kind of funny because when they say he's smiling, they say in this picture that Dario would be smiling. But you know, Dario, um, I just want to say on behalf of this group, a job well done. May you rest in peace and we will take it from here. God bless him, John. Thank you, guys. So, John, what a great presentation. Lots of interactivity. Of course, many, many thanks from all of our participants. Really great job done. I, I do have some a, a couple of follow-up questions that I wanted to share with you that we actually went through all of them. Okay. And, you know, one of the questions that came up was uh, really – you needed to stabilize her, but tell us about what other choices do you think that you could have made and maybe just review that one more time. So in that case, um, and we actually, we, we had another option that we entertained, but it was unentertainable for the surgeon. And that is we wanted to have the helo go back and get the surgical team and have them come down and cannulate at bedside. Unfortunately, the surgeon was not available. So that option was out. Um, so the only option that we had, you know, we, we, we wanted to stabilize her from an oxygenation standpoint. 
I had a feeling because we've done this for a while now. You know, both of us had a feeling that, you know, we know what can happen when we flip patients. That's why we wanted her to flip before we got there. But for whatever reason, when we said that, the staff didn't make that decision to do it because they may have known something too. So that's why when we got bedside and they didn't flip her, we had you know, a lot of questions. So the option would be to get the cannulation team down there and do that at bedside, or we didn't take her. But the only chance that she had at survival was to at least get on ECMO because she was not getting better with the current vent settings. So those are the those are the options that we had. If she's not stable enough to to get to Orlando, you know, there's 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 something that's called they're they're too sick to transport. Mm -hmm. They're too sick not to transport. So we do our best to get them to a place where we think we can get the job done and you know, with every move, every everything that we did with that patient was was so methodical and thought out that, you know, you get her from the bed to the stretcher and hands off, let's see what happens. All right, good. We'll buckle her in. We'll put the monitor on her. Now, how does she look? Okay, good. Let's transport her to the ambulance, load her up. Okay, stop. How does she look? This was a very methodical approach to that. And those are the patients they have to do it on because we knew if we didn't get her back to Orlando, she wasn't going to make it. So those were the options we have. Your, your hands are are very tied. You would have a lot of questions to answer to if you put somebody in the back of an ambulance for a 25 minute drive with lights and sirens with a SAT of 58 and they code. You know, you didn't do anything at bedside to to, to try and mitigate that. So yeah. we did the best we could and, and we used the tools that we had to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I applaud you every day of the week and uh, of the transports that you do and you provide such incredible support to the patients uh, during the most difficult times in the very smallest of places even it, you know it, it's amazing one other question and then i know that we ran over just a little bit one other question came across do you have a medical director to consult with for your flight services uh yes we do our medical director is extremely involved and he um, he is available. Um, my directors are both available. Um, we have 295 pages of protocols that we can practice under. Uh, again, our medical director is embraces us by using our heads, and we can think outside the box. We can use different approaches. Um, we may have a and A session afterwards, but if you're benefiting the patient and you're not hurting the patient, he's going to support you. So. We do have medical control. Um, we had a physician, the sending physician, who was a pulmonary crit medicine, critical care medicine guy at the bedside, who was extremely supportive of everything that we wanted to do. So we had a lot of buy-in, and that's key to success. I mean, making sure that the people that you have surrounding you and that are supporting you uh, support the cause, and we we don't have that issue. 